Okay, so so far we've established two things. There is a small world phenomenon in social and other networks, and there's all this interesting local structure, which we can capture in part by measuring clustering. And this extends beyond social networks, right? That you have high clustering and short average shortest paths. For example, in, you have this in neural networks, um, actor collaboration networks, which are admittedly social, semantic networks of languages and networks such as food webs. The first two tie it together. How is it possible to have high clustering and low average shortest path were Watts and Strogatz. What they said is, let's start with a regular lattice. In this lattice, every node is connected to its two closest neighbors on either side, so four neighbors total. And you can, you can vary this, this number, of course. And we're going to start rewiring or just adding random edges. Eventually, it's going to look like an Erdos-Renyi random graph because all of the edges are going to be random. But what they wanted to know is what happens in the middle. And so I mentioned two ways that they can go about this. They can rewire the links. So um, for example, here, this node used to be connected to this one in the lattice, but now it has a random tie to a randomly chosen other node. Or you can simply just add edges on top of the existing lattice, eventually getting something that looks mostly random, but it's overlaid on the original lattice in the ring. And you just take care not to do some things, for example, rewire to yourself or, you know, um, have multiple edges to the same node. So just to recap, you have this lattice, each node has uh, four nearest neighbors, and we want to distinguish now that we can tune what does the network look like when there's a small probability p of linking to a random node as opposed to just the, your neighbors on the lattice, and what happens. So for small p, we know it should look like a regular lattice. For large p, we know it should look like a random graph. So just to check your understanding, which one of these is a result of higher rewiring probability. So hopefully you can see that this one has had more rewiring happening or it actually looks like that in, in this algorithm the edges were just added on top. But now we're interested in what happens in between. As we vary p, is it true that you can't have small shortest paths without also having low clustering, or can you find a sweet spot? And indeed, if you vary P here, so this is 1% of the links rewired, here you have 10% of the links, you can see that even by the time you have 1% rewired, the average shortest path of the network has pretty much dropped to uh, far below what it was in the regular lattice. On the other hand, the clustering coefficient is still pretty much at the value that it was in the lattice. So you get this in-between regime where with just a few random links you have high clustering but low average shortest path. And then of course as you continue to add more and more random links then um, the clustering itself falls and, will and the average shortest path will continue to be very low. It, it basically asymptotes to what it is for the random graph. And you can try this out in NetLogo. So you can set this up and then you can vary the probability like so, and observe what happens to the clustering coefficient and the average shortest path. You can estimate how the clustering coefficient falls as a function of the rewiring probability p simply by considering that the chance that a rewiring will form a triad by accident is very slow. What's What's going to contribute more to the clustering coefficient is the probability that out of this triad, all three of these edges were preserved, which means that 
you know, each one of them is going to be rewired with probability 1 minus p, so the probability that all three of them are intact is 1 minus p to the third, and then the clustering coefficient for this given rewiring probability is, then is just a drop from the original lattice clustering coefficient times 1 minus p to the third, and this is what the function looks like. Here it's on linear instead of logarithmic axis, axes, but there isn't really such an analytical um, derivation for average shortest paths. And here we can just look at a bunch of different networks and see how their empirical properties match up with what we expect of a small world network. So to, the thing to look at is these are networks of widely varying sizes. They're quite different. Film actors, co-authorship network, uh, substrate graph and E. coli, and the C. elegans neural network. This is the actual shortest path, and this is the shortest path in the equivalent random graph. And you can see here that these values are actually quite, uh, quite close, if not in some cases even a bit lower. Um, so it's not the case that because these networks have more structure that their average shortest path is any uh, is significantly longer than it is for an equivalent Erdos-Renyi random graph. And then if we look at clustering, here is what it would be for the equivalent random graph. You can see rather small values and the actual observed is much, much higher. So these are all highly clustered networks that have the small world property. So which of the following is a description matching a small world network? just to make sure we, we understand what we're talking about here over and over again. What is missing, though, from the Watts-Strogatz model? It's, it's neat that it could explain clustering coexisting with short paths, but there's much in the real world that it doesn't capture. For example, it rewires the links at random, and for most of us, our experience is that we're not just as likely to know someone across the globe, no matter what Coursera is doing at the moment um, to help bring us all together, um, than someone who maybe is in the neighboring town, right? So maybe it would make sense for the links to depend on geography. Yes, I'm much more likely to know people living on my street, but I'm also more likely to know people who live in the same city than I am to know people in a distant city. And what about hierarchical structure and groups? I mean, you can think of geography in a hierarchical way where um, a neighborhood is part of a city that might be um, part of a larger urban area that's part of a county, etc. Et um, so how is that captured? And maybe geography is not the only um, the only kind of nested structure that we're in. We're part of different organizations as well. How are those nested? And then it doesn't capture the presence of hubs, which we know to play a very important role in uh, many networks. Um, with the Watts-Strogatz model, for the for the original lattice, each node has exactly the same degree. So naturally there are no hubs, but even as you rewire, the model that you're tending to is the erdos renyi random graph, which again does not have hubs. So the model doesn't really capture a lot of the real structure, but it goes a long way towards explaining what we do see. Here's a hint as to how geographic ties may be distributed. This is from the original paper by Milgram. He says, the geographic movement of the message from Nebraska to Massachusetts is striking. There's a progressive closing in on the target area as each new person is added to the chain. So it seems like the way that the message is traveling is that it makes large hops initially, and then as it gets um, closer, it's really homing in using short um, nearby ties. So how is that possible? 
Well, John Kleinberg proposed a model of small worlds that are laid out on a lattice, so for example, in a 2D lattice. He said, in addition to these local lattice edges, you're going to have the probability of a link between, say, nodes U and V to be proportional to the distance between U and V to this exponent minus R. And the question is, what happens as this exponent varies? So I'm going to just show you briefly a NetLogo demo that I'm going to try and figure into your assignment. So here we can vary what R is, and um, you can set up the network. It's, um, it's rather uh, slow because you need a large lattice in order to see how the search starts to work. And then we're going to repeatedly be selecting a target and a starting point and seeing using a greedy search at each point each node selects one of its neighbors who's closest to the target how quickly does the message reach the target and you can also vary the um, this probability so we can make the links highly localized by increasing R. So let's just look at what that looks like. Hopefully you will, you should, you should be able to see the edges. Okay, right. So almost all the edges are local and if they do come out, they're just kind of being very, very short bridges. And so if we then do a search, you can see it going very, very gradually because it basically has to make all of these little steps. On the other hand, if we um, change it so that we allow many long range ties, let's see what that looks like. The, the edges might be so far ranging that they'll obscure the lattice structure altogether, <laughs> indeed. And now we can uh, start and here the lattice really isn't large enough to, to, to show what's going on but typically you see a very um, large initial jump and then kind of going along the lattice and what that's showing you is that maybe it's best if I move back to the slides okay so what you should be seeing is when the edges are random, you have these long hops initially, but then there are no short range ties. So you basically have to go ch -ch 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 -ch, right to get to the target. Um, and you know, there are many other edges present, but none of them really took you in the right direction. Oh, sorry, I guess I'm still running that logo because it's being very loud. <laughs> okay, so hopefully it's going to quiet down. Um, on the other hand, if we have this very high value of R, then what happens is that we just don't have that many long range ties. So again, we're kind of stuck, you know, th there are ties heading in the right direction, but we're still stuck making very slow progress. And then finally, ideally for one over distance squared, what we have is both the presence of some long range ties and then some shorter range ties once we're close to the target that we can use. And this is this concept of navigability. That is, does the placement of the edges allow you to, at each step, make some amount of progress towards your goal. And what Kleinberg proved was that indeed, if the exponent r is 2, that is the probability of linking to someone falls as 1 over the distance squared, then you can make enough progress on at each step such that the number of steps that you have to take um, only grows logarithmically. So your quiz question, just to test whether you understood this, what is true about a network where the probability of a tie falls off as distance to the minus two? And just to 
reminder, I mean, I've brought this up before, um, that the interesting structure that we see in social networks and other networks could really be a projection of a bipartite network. For example, if you have different contexts and individuals, and then you have individuals who share a context um, have uh, joined ties. So why not model this explicitly? So Kleinberg also proposed a hierarchical net network model where you have these nested groups and the probability that two individuals share an edge is proportional to a constant to the minus alpha and then the distance that you have to go up in the hierarchy to get from one to the other. Also, if you just are, have these nested groups and then you have Q being the size of the smallest group that these nodes of interest V and W belong to, then the probability of an edge existing between V and W is going to be um, Q to the minus alpha. So two different ways of representing nested group structure such that you can now not only use it to represent geography, as I said, neighborhoods, parts of cities, parts of counties, but also other things such as individuals who are taking the same class, say, at a university, who, are, who have the same major, who are in the same uh, school within the university, who are part of the same university, who are part of the universities in that country, etc. And at, concurrently, Watts, Dodds, and, and Newman um, proposed another hierarchical model, which is very similar, that said that the probability that I and J know each other is again proportional to e to the minus alpha x, where x is, is equivalent to h in the previous slide. It's the, it's the number of steps up in the hierarchy you have to go in order to um, join two individuals. And what was different about their work was that they looked at navigation when you have different hierarchies. So you can concurrently have a hierarchy for geography, a hierarchy for occupation, and when individuals are searching, they can switch between hierarchies. So if I know that my target lives in Massachusetts, but I also know that he's a stockbroker, well, then I can decide, oh, I know someone who's not in Massachusetts, but who's a stockbroker, or I can choose, oh, I know someone who lives in the neighboring town, even though they're not in the banking industry, um, I, I will forward the message to them. And these, these theoretical models then correspond closely to what was found in early experiments. There's a neat uh, reverse small world experiment that Kilworth and Bernard did. They're the same ones who looked at the uh, accuracy of the chains that individuals are able to create. Um, so they gave individuals a whole slew of hypothetical targets. So they weren't actually running the chains. They were just curious who would you pick and why? And they found that overwhelmingly people chose based on geography and occupation. So those two hierarchies make a lot of sense. And only 7% were chosen because they were hubs, because that's someone who knows a lot of other people. And also there was an absence of second degree strategy. So I'm going to pick my friend because I know they know someone in Massachusetts. So that seemed to be relatively rare. If we go back to the email experiment that was run out of um, Columbia, um, one additional nice analysis that they did was to look at successful chains versus ones that didn't quite make it. And what they found with the successful chains was that they disproportionately used weak ties, professional ties, uh, ties originating at work or college, and those that focused on, on the target's work. Uh, and they disproportionately avoided using hubs, and there, were no, there was no evidence of funnels. So in the original uh, Milgram experiment, it seemed like the last people in the chain tended to be the same 
to, you know, another stockbroker and maybe a tailor from the um, from this, the town where the stockbroker lived. Um, but there was no evidence of funneling in this new experiment. Um, and also people in successful chains used uh, family and friendship ties less, and these tend to, tend to be, again, strong ties. And the strategy, interestingly, paralleled that of the Milgram experiment, which is that individuals first focused on geography, you know, like get it to the right country, then worry about what the, what the person's um, profession is. But those last few hops tended to reach the targets professionally as opposed to just um, trying to narrow down geographically.